we're really, uh, in a way, trying to create an environment that attracts the smartest people. And one of the ways to do that is to uh, create a culture and an environment that looks inevitable five years from now, or 10 years from now, mm -hmm. not today. A big part of um, Star Trek is always being able to uh, predict ahead what's going to happen. And that's all about uh, physically modeling uh, real world systems. Basically, the world is this incredibly rich and complex place with all sorts of very, very interesting, complicated things happening around us. And it turns out that you can sort of find astonishingly simple models and then allow people not only to see, but also to interact with these kinds of phenomena in real time. You could imagine uh, ha building uh, computer programs which have good reduced dimensional models of the airflow around an airplane and uh, controlling and therefore being able to have build like much, much better controllers for a helicopter, for an airplane or something like that, or for a spaceship going at warp speed. Carnegie Mellon turns out to be um, one of the top research centers in the United States for humanoid robots. There is a lot of very interesting work on developing social robots, robots that uh, reliably evoke uh, a, an emotional response of a particular type from a person. The first thing we're going to look at is how to make characters and robots really interactive. Uh, and that means that there might not be a puppeteer in the background actually choosing what behaviors the character would do, but instead it would really be measuring and responding to the audience. There's a general uh, idea that's in Star Trek of, um, that Bones uses, um, which is this weird sensor that you just wave over a person and you, so you know what's wrong with them. So my research is basically creating analytical methods uh, to help physicians and biologists make their decisions based on data. Ideally, it'll be some sort of thing that you have in your hand that will say, yes, this patient is at high risk for organ failure or something very severe like, like that. And given that information, the doctor will take that into consideration and make an appropriate choice for treatment. Claytronics, um, if it's successful, I think will create a new form of communication. And so in Star Trek, in a way, the communication is kind of mundane. Um, you can talk through your communicator, uh, you can do video, um, but if you want to be there face to face, you have to go through this big hassle of actually going there. The idea behind programmable matter is that you have some stuff, like let's say a pile of sand, that has computational power and you can download a program to that stuff and as it computes, it changes its shape or some other physical property. You'd have a pile of claytronics in your office, I'd have a pile of claytronics in my office, and you would sort of, your 3D model would get assembled in my office and my 3D model would get assembled in your office and we'd be able to interact as if we were there. Imagine artwork that understands your gaze and your physicality and reacts accordingly. And you have the f basic building block of holodeck. The, the new research I'm doing involves eyes and how people use them. And in particular, I'm interested in sort of asking the questions, you know, what if an artwork was aware of how it was being looked at? What if uh, it could respond to how it was being looked at with, let's say, eyes of its own? Using, in other words, uh, a, a physical language that people could understand. What science needs more than anything else is grand challenges and ridiculous ideas and a huge constant stream of them and I, those have very much come from science fiction. I think that the, the key thing about something like Star Trek and its influence on science um, is that if you're willing to suspend disbelief and say, you know what, let's say it is possible and start from that point of view. It's really about just sort of you know, stimulating your imagination and start thinking about the, you know, the various possibilities. And, you know, there are a number of scientists even in, at Carnegie Mellon who you feel like they've never lost that sort of sense of play. 